Good afternoon, my name's Luke Pompey from Dig Deep TV. We made the trip down from Leeds to London today to interview Richard West, aka Mr C, the guy behind Super Freak, and one of the main finders behind the end in London. How's it going, Richard? Yeah, I'm great. How are you? Yeah, wicked, man. So we've got stuck in a little bit of traffic today, but we're finally here. We've got you outside the place where you founded, the End Nightclub in London. Yep, for place formerly known as The End. Yep. yep. What, what is it now? The now it's, well, now it's an empty building, and I believe there's uh, squatters living in there. <laughs> there was some squatters parties, which was very refreshing to hear about. Yeah, I heard about that. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, after we closed, it was called The Den for a little while, but it was an unsuccessful venture. Okay. Yeah. But before that, it was the end. Before Very that, it successful. was the greatest nightclub in the world. Um, we opened in December uh, 1995. Uh, it took us two years to build. Uh, when we started building, uh, this part right here didn't actually exist. This was AKA, and we had like uh, the end door there, and the, the offices were upstairs, and it was basically the club. There's a stairs that go down into the basement. Um, for three years, this was basically, none of this building was here. And I used to open a fence and drive in and park my car there, and it was just open. None of this part of the building existed at all. It was just all, all fenced off. Um, so we built on top uh, of the end and built AKA Bar and Restaurant, uh, which uh, gave us a third room and a greater capacity as well. Um, yeah, the building of AKA took about a year. The building of the end took two years, and we was open for 13 years. So good, a good. We had a good stint there. Yeah, very successful. Yes. How did it all come about? What were well, the ideas? It came about. Uh, it was actually a good friend of mine, Leo Paskin, um, of Leo and Bushwhacker fame. Yeah. He came to uh, my house and said he had a project that he'd like me to get involved with. Uh, or would I be interested in looking at? And I said, well, what you got? He said, well, my dad is an architect, uh, PKS architects, amazing architects. He said he'd been commissioned to uh, turn a building, this place, into um, some sort of an entertainment spot or a nightclub or a restaurant, etc. So I said, yeah, I'm interested, let's have a look. So we came down and we had a look and it was three tunnels going that way, yeah, underneath the building. And then there was a, a fourth tunnel that went this way underneath it was all in the basement and I looked at it like well, the tunnels started coming up about here so it was pretty low uh, it was used back in the day for uh, horses uh, to drag the mail around and these horses never saw the light of day they lived underground and uh, basically what we needed to do is like the three tunnels the two tunnels on that side of the two tunnels on that side of the building we had to excavate two meters down to get the height that we required and we put all the air conditioning units underneath the floor. We sprung a, a dance floor on hydraulics so that people's legs didn't hurt. And then we had to break through the tunnels because it was only at the ends of each tunnel that you could get through. Right. So we had to make breakthroughs and stuff like that. We had to underpin the whole building with a, um, a ton of silicon concrete just so that you know we could support it while going through. The third tunnel uh, became uh, the toilets, the boys' toilets and the girls' toilets. Uh, but that was higher, that was more its original okay, level. Cool. And then uh, the bar that went this way, and then it went into a bar, st the, that tunnel that went this way became the bar and the bar storage. And basically what we did here was we built a, f um, we built a ceiling, because even from the basement, you look up and it was sky. So we had to build like a whole ceiling, a roof, and um, like basically a flat floor here, which is what I parked my car on top of. <laughs> and. Um, yeah, so that, that was the main structure of the building. The venue held was a, had a license capacity for 800. We could squeeze 950 in there maybe because we had great escapes. Um, you know, the main doors, round the corner, there was a fire escape and one round the other side there as well. So because we had such good exiting facilities, we got quite a good uh, size license. Um, so yeah, it was there for, like that for three years and then we built AKA on top. And after that, uh, we ran successfully for another 10 years fantastic project. Oh, good. What, what was the parties called that you was putting on at the time? Well we did all sorts of parties. When we originally opened um, on Fridays we did our own thing uh, called Flavor which lasted a year and that was a house music party and then on the Saturdays we did techno events. Uh, I did my uh, subterrain night which was legendary uh, that, that lasted until 2002, seven years and I decided to change things up a bit. But we had all sorts. We had the uh, classic records. We had um, uh, Ultimate, Carl Cox's night. We had uh, Laurent Garnier on a regular basis. We did Cocoon nights. We had DTPM on the Sunday. You know, basically anything that was big in, uh, but still uh, like underground in deep house, house, tech house, techno, acid house, breaks, drum and bass. We kind of stuck to that groove. We didn't go down the route of 
uh, trance or prog okay. or commercial stuff we kept it underground so for running that long being one of the first clubs in London I can imagine well yeah um, basically in London at that time there was uh, like the West End clubs where they were all pretty tacky moody bouncers rubbish drinks no ice they were even turning the water taps off so you couldn't wash your hands after going to the loo which is you know it's terrible health and safety um, so we just like when we started building the club it was like well what do we want to do so it wasn't we didn't think about how we wanted the club, we thought about how we didn't want the club. We, want, we didn't want a crappy sound system, we didn't want bad drinks, we didn't want slow service, we didn't want, you know, so we started there. And that was why we built, uh, you know, like wood, sprung a wooden dance floor and put hydraulics on it, because we didn't want people's legs hurting. We put a free drinking water fountain outside the toilet so people could fill up their bottles with water uh, okay. for free because we didn't want people getting dehydrated. We put in an amazing sound and lighting rig, we had furniture, by Philippe Stark in the lounge, you know, we just did it right, right down the line. Um, all, all the staff were dressed in uh, Daniel Paul outfits. They made them specifically Looking for us. Yeah, well, they, the, all the, the, they were jumpsuits for the bar staff. Right. Uh, they looked pretty hot on the girls, to be <laughs> fair. Very, uh, you know, like 90s futuristic jumpsuits by Daniel Paul. And even the security were wearing Daniel Paul jackets and stuff. It, they looked really, really cool. So we just tried to get it right all the way down the line. Um, musically, the sound, the, the lighting, the visual we wanted to be comfortable we wanted you to have good drinks we wanted the security to be friendly and that's how we worked it and it worked out perfectly so everything um, you'd want out of a club if well, you yeah, was a the best exactly anyway. I mean the first year was a nightmare because you know people are, uh, that are into underground music were used to dodgy warehouses CD venues you know just like absolute crap uh, right. the West End was all about posy Sharon and Tracy wearing you know like Gucci it was, aw it was awful so um, you know we, we did something that took people quite a while to actually get into and say hold on a minute this is something very special and in the first year we almost went bankrupt it was really hard work because it cost a pretty penny to build and it was really hard work but we stuck to our guns we stuck with the underground music we kept, people, it, real. We kept it real and very quickly London caught on and was, it became one of those spots that was adored by proper underground London well, so tell us about some of the acts that you broke here yeah, some of the oh well we broke some amazing acts um, you know people that went on to get gold discs and stuff like um, you know, you know, Fat Boy Slim, wow. um, he, he was a regular here. Ronnie Sires was another one that was a regular here. So, you know, there were lots of people we, we helped break. You know, Leo and, Bu Leo and Bushwhacker started from here. Um, you know, the, obviously, it, it, there was so many people. We supported underground DJs from London, from people like Femi B, right the way through. And, you know, we had, like, so much on, like, Errol Alcum, okay. um, he did his uh, night called Durr, before that it was called, what was it called? Um, Trash. Which was on a Mondays, um, so you know, like there was lots of great nights here, and we'd do all sorts of things. And it, like I said, the DJs would range from Carl Cox, Darren Emerson, Sven Bath, Laurent Garnier, myself, Derek Carter. The list is endless. We could just keep going on. So, what brought it to an end after such a successful period running the club? What? Well, uh, well, yeah, I mean, like uh, we, when we finished, it was uh, Jan at the end of January 2009. And uh, it was the summer before, July, and uh, we had a new um, owner of the building for about three years. And he was harassing us to get out because he wanted to build like luxury apartments okay, right. uh, and just do uh, go up. And this was the only, f this face uh, basically was listed. So you couldn't change this face of the building. Yeah. So the entrance had to be here. You couldn't do it somewhere else because they needed to work on this side of the building and uh, basically we said well no we've got a 25 year lease we're not going anywhere we're, we're enjoying our work he harassed us for three years to get out and finally in july of uh, 2008 he said to us you, in january 2009 you got, you're going to have eight years left on your lease i'm not right. going to renew the lease um, but what i'll do right now i will offer you eight years profit at your best year wow. which was the year before 2007 for you to close in january so we was like, well, great, let's do it. I mean, you know, do we work for eight years with the hope of maybe earning that Especially amount? Especially in that climate, yeah. clubbing was at, well, at that time. Well, yeah. no, well, it was absolutely full on, but we I thought mean, it was a, gr a great exit for the club. Uh, we've been 30 year, 13 years running as the, one of the best clubs in the world. Um, it was just peaking. We were open seven nights a week in some capacity, and it was unbelievable. So uh, it was for us, it was a bit of a no-brainer to have that kind of an exit and finish with legendary status rather than yeah, maybe passing. peter out or something like that. Um, so we, we, agreed the ter we agreed terms in July 2008, and that was it. Then we started to go about our exit plan. Um, a month later, 
later came the credit crunch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so in September, uh, the guy after harassing us for three years asked us if we would stay. We said no. We've already made an agreement. What do, do we do? We work for three years and what? Not earn any money. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, it doesn't make sense for us. Uh, so we decided to carry on and close it. So we started um, in, in the beginning of December of 2008. Uh, all of the uh, closing parties for each individual night. So every night had its own closing. And then the penultimate closing was on the 23rd of January 2009, which was magical. Documentary about that, it looks yeah. amazing. Yeah, it was amazing.